Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story, Karen tried to act illegally and I stopped cooperating with her and she lost her lawyer. The second story, owner got a fire in his club because he didn't believe me, now he lost the club. The third story, my boss told me that she would not approve me to work remotely, so I chose another way. The first story is, do your job and get me what I'm entitled to. My law school offers a free legal advice and representation service to low-income earners in the city. We the students volunteer in this service and help people with their cases. Most of our cases are related to contracts, employment, tenancy, wills or petty crime, and we're limited by our mandate to not provide support for anything too intensive e.g. jail time possibility, divorce, automobile accidents, etc. Anything we send out to clients or third parties must go through our supervising lawyers, SL. Also, keep in mind most of the students, including me, are volunteers going through full-time law school and have jobs outside the classroom, so working on the files usually takes a bit of time. One of my clients, M, came in with what seemed like a simple case. She told me that she was being evicted by her landlord without being provided sufficient notice and as such wanted to get compensated. A week goes by and I got working on her file, doing research on our local residential tenancy statutes and calling her a few times to iron out the details. The landlord had given the tenant notice in November 2017 on a handwritten slip of paper, which technically isn't the proper way to serve notice, about the fact that the unit is needed for a family member to move in by February 1st. At this point, it was already mid-January and getting close to the move-out date of January 1st. Our local statutes provided that landlords must give two months notice in the proper form prior to terminating the rental for occupation, as well as one month free rent to the tenant. So I get on the phone with M and tell her that she can either refuse the notice and continue the tenancy since it wasn't served properly, or she can move out and we'll get her one month free rent for her. At this point, she completely changes her tone and demands that we ask for two months of free rent. Apparently, it takes her that long to find a new place get her damage deposit back before moving out and have the landlord pay for her moving fees. I told her that's basically not possible since she's not entitled to that by law and she starts flipping out at me over the phone, telling me how her landlord is a crazy person and we're totally useless if we can't claim what's fair for her. So tell her I need to meet with the SL next week to discuss the situation. The SL essentially tells me that my assessment is accurate and that we can't make claims that run counter to the law, pretty obvious. Before I could call her in the afternoon, she calls me through our switchboard, routed through to me. It turns out she called like four times that day and tells me that she's freaking out because her landlord served a 10-day eviction notice on her door. The eviction notice was for failure to pay rent for January, which is a valid and totally separate eviction claim. M never told me she withheld rent for January. At this point, we were basically three days away from January 31st. Due to this new notice, we can no longer argue the tenancy was still in effect, since she would still get kicked for non-payment. The only remedy was to argue that the one month of rent was withheld because M had expected to move out by the end of January. So I tell M she needs to get out of there by January 31st if she wants to protect herself and will help her communicate with the landlord and ask for the January withholding to be in lieu of the one month free rent. Lo and behold, February rolls around and she was still occupying the unit into the first week of the month. So the landlord filed a second eviction notice for failure to pay rent for February. She's now two months behind rent and is facing two valid eviction notices, one of which is coming up in three to four days, so she's pretty screwed. If she's evicted due to non-payment, she will get absolutely nothing, not even the one month free rent. The best course of action is that she needs to pay her January rent to satisfy the January notice and we can continue to claim the one month free rent for February, which is already pushing it in the eyes of the law and hopefully keep her from becoming homeless in the next week. I get onto the phone with her again to tell her that she needs to pay a month of rent she begins to shout at me over the phone and essentially tells me I'm crazy and incompetent and I'm in a conspiracy to side with the landlord. She says she absolutely refuses to pay a cent to the landlord and that she deserved two months rent and deposit returned immediately and moving fees covered. She said and I quote, I know the laws of the place. I can read too, you know. Obviously, you guys don't want to help me because you think it's too hard. Don't lie to me. I know what I deserve in this situation. So just do your job and get me what I'm entitled to or else I will do it myself. I said, okay ma'am, I've already told you what you're entitled to and you don't want it, so I'm going to do my job, which is to follow the law. I hung up and had a quick 5 minute chat with the SL. 
He backed me and said that he gets at least one or two of these types of people each year and told me to draft a letter to M and close the file. So I drafted a short and sweet letter and basically told her, following your instructions, we're ceasing to provide any further representation. Our organization is mandated to comply with the law and upon being informed of this, you've elected for self-representation. Good luck on your legal issue. SL approved within minutes and had it sent out. About a week later, I received an email from M. It's filled with expletive insults and one sentence that reads, You and everyone at your organization are useless and will never be good lawyers. I thought you were all smart, but tell your SL and worthless friends that they're better off planting potatoes, because all of you can only be potato farmers. I had a good chuckle in class and never heard from her again. The second story is, Don't want to listen? Well then, close your establishment. I'm a very good trained light operator for big events. Since I learned it all from a friend, I don't have any diploma, but my work spoke for itself, so I got decent jobs and amazing references. Eventually I started to do concerts up to a thousand people, and was comfortable to charge full price. Since those jobs came irregularly, I started a job at a local nightclub so I could plan my spare time better. In this nightclub I got hired with full responsibility of PA and stage lights. The boss was pretty entitled on his position, even though he had no idea how things worked. This led to a lot of dispute. All the interior was rather on the cheap end, and infrastructural problems limited the possibilities. In fact, it was a very small room, but he always came to me like, I was clubbing all over the world, I know what's possible, and I want you to make that possible here. I just answered with, if you're giving me the biggest screens and the cheapest execution, you can't expect the most expensive effects. For example, if you want a pink light, but you don't have a pink filter, I can't make that happen. This escalated to a pointless conversation to nowhere. Afterward, I sent him unasked a plan on how to throw all the oversized SH out, sell it, and get an actually decent light show that would fit better. A moving light made for 8 meters plus height is amazing, but does not make any sense on a stage that has only a quarter of that height. Anyways, when Halloween was coming, I saw those cotton spider webs for decoration. They can really take a beating, barely rip, and melt when they get warm. Knowing this, I walked up to the decorator and told him to not wrap the moving lights with those nets, since they easily get jugged into the motor, mess things up, block the motors, and in the worst case, melt. When Halloween came along, the place was very cringily decorated. I did not give two Fs, since it was the decorator's job, and people seemed to like it. But all the moving lights were covered in this webbing. I told them to change it immediately, since there were 16 of them, and every single one at a price of 8,000 bucks. The club owner once more came and told me to just ignore it. They made it like that all the time, and it worked so far. This was going for too long, and yeah, I already had an offer from a rival establishment, so I warned him again and then just left to do as he told. The Halloween party ended after only one and a half hours, in the best way I could imagine. 30 minutes after starting the show, all the moving lights were stuck in the webbing, motors out of control, and molten plastic dropping from the ceiling. I turned them off, leaving me with 10 backup spots. Boss calls on radio. What the F? Where's all the lights? Me. The moving heads are down. I can still try to repair them now since the damage is not severe. Boss. F this SH. You turn them back on right now and get people to party. Me. Just for protocol, if I turn the moving lights back on, they will be foobar. F'd up beyond all recognition. Within minutes. And you want me to do that? Boss. They won't. And yes, that's what you should do. So I did. It looked glorious. Then the first people ran out because they had molten plastic dripping onto their shoulders and head, and even better, then it started smoking and smelling like fire on the dance floor. So I radioed back to my boss. Me, people are leaving and I think the lights are about to catch fire. I break your things on command is one thing, but I won't put people in danger here. No answer. Five minutes later he stood behind me and told me to go home. He'll do it for himself. I just left and went to the other club I'll start soon. Later I got a call from one of the barkeepers from the other place. The motors on the lights apparently set the cheap decoration on fire only 10 minutes after I've left. I went straight back. Fortunately, it was only a small fire and nobody was hurt. My boss was in front of the club, screaming at the firefighters and customers in a complete meltdown. About 15 people sued, and I was one of the witnesses in trial. Needless to say, he had to close down. I could have excluded the motors for him to use, but I think that way it was more fun. The last story is, I'll take my time away, thanks. I work in university housing. Running dorms on a campus is a seriously emotionally manipulative job that really plays up the we're a family rhetoric to guilt employees to investing wild amounts of time, energy, and money into this work. To avoid burnout, one must take time away, but it has to be away, as in not just staying home, 
because we live where we work. Our apartments are inside the buildings we run, so if we stay home, we still haven't left work. You've got to go somewhere else to really have some separation, but we get lots of guilt to avoid us taking that time away from campus. In recent months, taking time away has been made more and more complex by our supervisors. It used to be a request form that was either approved or denied the next day, and approval was almost guaranteed. Now, you submit a request form that must wait until the following Monday, so it can be discussed in a closed meeting. If you want more than one day off, once your request is approved, it's considered conditional, and you must submit a written plan for what your staff will be doing while you're gone. A draft of your out-of-office email, written confirmation that another employee will babysit your buildings while you're gone, and a copy of preparation materials given to that person. To be clear, our areas absolutely do not need babysitters. It's a circus, with the hopes that there will be so many hoops to jump through, we might give up on taking our time away. Not me. I'll jump. I've earned my time off and I'll be using it, thanks. I have a long-distance partner that I visit for three to four days every six weeks or so. He can't take time off like I can, as he's self-employed, and if he doesn't go to work, he doesn't get paid. So when I visit, he goes to work when he needs to, and I usually spend my day visiting with a longtime friend that lives nearby, or taking his dog on day-long adventures. But all the work I do at my job right now can be accomplished remotely. I want to take off four days for my next visit. I asked my boss if I could just request the time I'd actually be traveling as PTO, and then work remotely on the other weekdays and partial days during my trip. I thought this might be okay, as it would keep me occupied, and I could keep up with committee meetings, student meetings, and project timelines. My boss has never said so out loud, but I know she isn't happy with me for taking regular time off. It's been setting an example for the rest of my colleagues, who have also started taking more time off, which they should 100% be doing. Our department still runs smoothly, and my buildings are the best managed on campus. She's just upset I'm not being guilted appropriately to stay here all the time and keep working. My boss told me that she would not approve me to work remotely, as I had to be on campus to do my job. Mind you, during that meeting I was dealing with a cold and had been approved to work from home. I asked her why that was different than working from my partner's office. She told me that because I live on campus, I could still be called upon to respond to an emergency if needed. I asked her if I would ever be called on to respond to an emergency, as I'm in quarantine for illness and I'm not our designated emergency on-call person. She told me her decision was final, but if I still only wanted to take two days off, I could shorten my trip. I told her, no, that's fine. I just won't work at all for those four days. Clearly, this was not what she thought would happen. She replied that even though I would need to take PTO if I was off campus, I would still be more than welcome to attend committee and student meetings during my vacation. I told her, no thank you. If I have to take PTO, then I'll not be working during that time. Thank you for answering my questions though. She's been giving me the stink eye for the past week. I wish I felt sorry for her, but if you're going to make rules, you should be prepared for the possible outcome that people might just follow them. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.